Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And we are a hot mess <laughs> this week, guys. <laughs> Just laying it all out there. Um, life <sighs> has been so crazy for both of us. Um, Andrea, I think you're on no sleep right now. Zero sleep, zero sleep. <laughs> um, we we usually record on Fridays and then get editing done um, over the weekend and then publish the pod on Mondays. But guess what, guys? That didn't happen because life got in the way and we are recording on Monday, day of release. Um, I was just telling Andrea, I so I think I've I've shared with you guys that um, I've made the decision to to keep my kids home um, during during COVID. Obviously, uh, I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to do that. We have um, we've had childcare, but our amazing nanny is actually having a baby, and we we made the the difficult decision to send our kids back. And guess what? <laughs> Today we were supposed to send them back and got notification that their my my son's teacher was actually diagnosed with COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, world. So anyway, so uh no child care. My husband's here, but um that really doesn't mean much. Uh that sounds terrible. Sorry, <laughs> Ethan. No, it doesn't, it doesn't that that really came out wrong. It just means that they could all come barreling in at any moment. So I apologize any background noise. And, um, you know, as you guys saw on our Instagram, um, you know, I made a, a road trip down, um, you know, following all safety protocols to, to Florida. Um, I hadn't taken any time off in the last year, obviously for, you know, uh, work demand was, was pretty high. And, um, Josh and I, uh, got a late start in our drive home, uh, yesterday afternoon. So we drove through the night. Uh, I, I'm working today. Um, so we got home about 8 AM this morning and, uh, I immediately jumped into my regular work, uh, Monday meetings and, um, catching up from being, you know, technically off work. And so it's been a, it's been a day and I'm really excited to go to bed at six o'clock tonight. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. You are super. <laughs> human for real. Um, same, same to you. <laughs> so today we're actually going to tackle a bit of a lighter topic, which is such a relief. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about some common old wives tales. Um, and I hope that we're not offending anyone <laughs> with, with, with that name. Um, that's just, that's how just I, what they're called. That's just <laughs> what they're called. Sorry, guys. Um, before we do that, Andrea, did you want to recap briefly what we talked about last week? Yeah, so last week we talked about um, COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing and deployment, and uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, why it why the story isn't just as simple as, you know, give the vaccine recipe to other companies and just, you know, expand the capacity for manufacturing of the, the you know, the many different options that we have around the world. So we talked a little bit about the current state of vaccination, um, both here in the U.S., where we're based and also globally. Uh, we talked about, you know, the fact that there are many countries, um, you know, when I last checked 130 countries who didn't have any doses of any vaccines yet. Um, we talked a little bit about the different bottlenecks that are, um, you know, providing challenges to really ramping up vaccine manufacturing, distribution, storage, and administration. So there's multiple layers of bottlenecks there. There's actual manufacturing bottlenecks and raw material supply chain issues. There is um, bottlenecks associated with the actual distribution and storage. There is bottlenecks associated with um, personnel, and that could be shipping and transit personnel. It could be healthcare personnel to administer vaccines. Um, and of course, there are limitations on instrumentation and equipment that we need for um, all the manufacturing. So it's not, you know, as straightforward a story as many people think. Um, but we also did talk about some of the plans to overcome some of those bottlenecks. And since we recorded that episode, um, Johnson & Johnson, their one shot 
uh, one dose vaccine. It's an adenovirus based vaccine has been granted FDA emergency use authorization in the U S CDC's ACIP also, um, um, put their support behind this vaccine. And we do expect um, deployment of that vaccine in the U.S. this week. So that's a third vaccine in the toolkit for U.S. Uh, projections are very optimistic that millions more doses will be able to be deployed. And of course, we expect other countries um, to start expanding their capabilities. Johnson & Johnson has contracted with COVAX, which we also talked about last week, for hundreds of millions of doses of this vaccine for developing nations. We actually just posted the ingredients and why they're in the vaccine uh, today on our social media pages. Um, so lots of exciting stuff coming out with regard to vaccines. Um, but as uh, just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, we are going to take a little step back for this week. So be sure to keep checking out our social media media for all of the vaccine updates. And just really briefly, I just have to chime in with this, Andrea, because people keep asking us if, you know, whether we've received the vaccine. So just to, to <laughs> nip that in the bud, the answer is no, we are patiently or impatiently waiting for our turn until it's our turn. Um, no, we are we are not getting special access no. <laughs> to the vaccines, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's so funny, Jess, because technically, you know, where I am in Pennsylvania, I I'm, a, I'm, you know, a 1A employee. Um, you know, I, I handle infected samples in, in biomedical research. Um, but, you know, there, there's not a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of access. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, for myself um, that, that I'll be able to get my dose soon. Um, I know that compared to some other people, I am, you know, lower risk. I'm a younger individual and I'm relatively healthy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, I'm not, you know, I'm immune to getting sick and, and you know, potentially having severe effects. Um, and I think something that's worth mentioning is we've been asked this, you know, if we have a preference and I think J I can echo, you know, I can speak mm -hmm. for Jess here. We will get whatever vaccine is available when it comes our time. They are Happily. all, <laughs> yes, they are all great options. They are all beneficial at um, reducing severity of illness, reducing symptomatic illness, reducing hospitalization, reducing death. And actually there are now emerging data that suggests that they can also reduce asymptomatic um, infection and possibly also transmission. So they're all great options. They all have benefits. They all have some challenges. And of course we posted about that too. We sure did. <laughs> so, okay. So let's, let's dive into today's topic, these old wives tales. And we actually, we, we posted on our Instagram uh, asking folks to, to chime in with some of the old wives tales that you've all heard. And we received so many responses. So it seems like this topic will span two episodes. I don't think we'll be able to get through everything today. Let's kick things off talking about a very common old wives tale that I heard quite a bit growing up. Andrea, I'm sure you heard it too, which is that you're supposed to feed a cold but starve a fever. So Andrea, can you kick us off and talk mm, about Oh my this? gosh, yes. <laughs> so this idea, um, and, and of course we don't know for sure, but it likely originated sometime during the Middle Ages, which was, you know, anytime between four, the 400s to the 1400s. And this was um, back when people believed there were two kinds of illnesses. And of course we didn't know about germ theory and we didn't know about different types of microorganisms and things like that. And, and people back then and also had these very antiquated thoughts on body temperature. So, um, you know, the, the logic was colds and fevers were two different classes of illnesses. And if someone had a cold, they actually believed that the body of the afflicted person literally became colder. So in order to warm up their body, and I have warm up in air quotes here, um, they would feed that person, right? And, and the opposite was true if someone had a fever. So if someone had an elevated temperature, the logic was to not eat would then cool that patient down. Um, and that's kind of where that adage comes from. And they've also... 
Sorry, go ahead, Jess. Well, I was just going to say, I actually found something that um, said that we could trace this to this 1574 dictionary by some guy, John Withels. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which noted that, quote, fasting is a great remedy of fever. And exactly as you said, it, it, there's this belief that eating food may help the body generate warmth during a cold and that avoiding food may help it cool down when overheated. Uh, but Andrea, you could tell us how the immune system <laughs> actually works. <laughs> right. So, so you know, let's kind of kick that off with this is obviously a myth. Um, this is, you know, not not something we want to kind of ascribe to. Um, so, you know, we did talk about kind of immune system function in our um, spilling the immunity episode. So, you know, we do encourage you to tune into that one. But, but ultimately, the immune system needs a few key things for proper function. And when you get sick, what happens is your body and your immune system is recognizing this foreign invader, this pathogen. It's sounding the alarm. It's producing all sorts of chemicals. It's activating a bunch of a different immune cell types. And it's trying to actively fight it off and kill the pathogen so that you recover. So in order to do its job properly, the immune system needs things like rest, of course, um, hydration, and food. Um, you know, you need to fuel your cells. Your cells need energy in the form of ATP, um, and we maybe will get into something like that in a future episode, but ultimately in order to get that energy, you have to eat. And so starving a fever, starving yourself, not eating at all when you have a fever actually can be um, very dangerous. Well, I actually had a question for you, sort of related to this, but I have also heard many people say that you shouldn't treat a fever. You know, it's your body's way of of trying to, to fight the illness. And so you should just kind of let the fever ride and, you know, ha- help kill the, the pathogen in your body. What do you have to say? What say you, Andrea? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so low-grade fevers generally are not harmful to a person, but fevers can become very high. And, you know, once a temperature is above a certain threshold, it actually can be very dangerous to a person, to physiology, to your brain, um, and things like that. So you don't want to kind of let it run rampant, you know, taking NSAIDs, you know, fever reducing medications is not going to, you know, impact your body's ability to fight off an illness. Um, a lot of times the fever is a consequence of activating the immune system. So when you activate the immune system, you produce chemicals that lead to inflammation that lead to these systemic changes. Um, so, you know, if you feel, you know, terrible and you feel uncomfortable and you have a fever, you know, that's what we have over the counter, you know, antipyretics for to help right. reduce those fevers. So, Andrew, I know we were chatting a bit before this and we were saying that really we should be saying feed a cold and feed feed a fever, right? I mean, right. you don't want to force feed yourself, um, but your body needs fuel to, to Right, help. exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And when you're sick, you know, your body, your metabolic rate actually increases because – you need to fuel your immune system to help fight it off. And that's often why we tend to feel lethargic and we tend to feel groggy and things like that. Um, and that that metabolic rate increase is actually somewhat proportional to how much fever you have. Um, so you really do, you know, you want to feed a fever as well. Um, but, you know, on the converse, you don't want to force feed a cold. A lot of times when we're sick, especially when you have like congestion, your appetite can be suppressed. So you want to eat in moderation across the board. Um, and, and really, I think the big emphasis is proper nutrition is key um, for recovery. And, you know, there are some theories that the, the appetite suppression is maybe to reserve energy for fighting the infection as opposed to digesting food, but you still want to make sure that you, you know, take in nutrients. And, and that's really, I think, where this chicken soup comes in, right, Jess? Oh, um, I have. I must talk about chicken soup. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Just because my, my Jewish mother would kill me. So in, in my household, we grew up referring to, to chicken soup, especially with matzo balls, mm-hmm. as Jewish penicillin. And anytime you're sick, actually, just recently I was sick. And what did my mother do? She put on a pot of <laughs> matzo ball chicken soup. And so, you know, this was actually something a couple of people chimed in with. No, chicken soup is not some magical cure. 
cure. But exactly as you're saying, Andrea, you know, it helps to hydrate us, which is definitely mm-hmm. key, especially if, if you have a fever. Um, you're getting nutrients from the veggies and any proteins that are there that are in the soup. So that's that's good. Um, mm-hmm. And then also the heat from the chicken soup. Let's say you're congested, as you mentioned, the steam might help relieve congestion and, and alleviate some of those symptoms. So right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, you want to fuel your body, you know, regardless of what you're sick with and symptom alleviation is a, you know, it's going to make you, it's going to help you feel better. It's not going to cure or eradicate the, the infection. Um, you know, and chicken soup is warm, right? You know, same reason people drink tea, it, it soothes, um, you know, pain if you had a sore throat or things like that. So, um, yeah, feed a cold, feed a fever. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, you don't want to starve or or force feed in either instance. And and you know what actually helps when you have an inf- a respiratory infection in particular. Um, and and these are typically caused by viruses. Um, there's a whole array of different viruses, things like respiratory syncytial virus, rhinoviruses, even the human coronaviruses cause respiratory illnesses. So things that actually help, um, you know, hygiene, hand hygiene, proper hand washing, um, symptom alleviation things, as we mentioned, taking NSAIDs, so fever reducers or antipyretics, as we call them, um, hot liquids like Mama Steyer's chicken soup. <laughs> um <laughs> Which you is know, magical. Which, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm also a fan of matzo soup, so I can't oh, uh, can't goodness. can't turn my nose up at that. Um, you know, adding moisture to the air. So some people find a humidifier soothing. But the big things are rest, as much rest as you can. Hydration is critically important and proper nutrition. And something else that I really need to throw in there, um, a lot of people when they get sick, especially with respiratory infections, they'll go to the doctor or the urgent care center and they will demand antibiotics. And viral infections do not require antibiotics. You just have to let them, you know, take their course, you know, unless there's a legitimate antiviral, like in the case of influenza, there is Tamiflu that you can take. Um, But antibiotics are not helpful um, when treating viral infections. Right. So for something like the common cold, which is caused by rhinovirus. <laughs> you mm-hmm. don't want to take an antibiotic because again, it's a virus and viral infections do not require antibiotics. So yes, that's a very, very important point to make. Okay. Exactly. All right. So anything All right. else on this or can we move no, on? No, no, I think. Card? Yeah. Let's um let's let's jump into the next one, which is kind of related, I think. So uh, I'm gonna let you kick it off, but this is another one that we hear and I've heard since I was a little kid. Um that cold weather or Going out with wet hair in the winter makes you sick. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. I've heard this all the time. I still hear it. Again, Mama Steyer, don't forget your sweater. I hear it every single time I leave the house, even though I live in Florida and it never drops below 70 degrees. But okay. So this is a really great example of something that we say time and time again, which is that correlation does not equal causation. So we know, and we'll talk more about this in a second, Andrew, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this, that many people, what we know that respiratory infections tend to be more common in cold weather. So people falsely attribute this to the to the weather and or exposure with wet hair. But it's not the wet hair or the cold weather that is causing the sickness, right? So Mm -hmm. let's talk about what's true and what's not. So Andrea, can you talk to us a little bit about colds and respiratory infections? Um, Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we just chatted about, you know, colds, um, you know, and cold is a catch-all. Rhinoviruses are the most common cause, but there are other sorts of um, mild respiratory viruses, as I mentioned, respiratory syncytial virus is one. There's a metanumovirus and things like that. But um, these respiratory infections are caused by viruses. They're not caused by the weather. And and again, as just mentioned, you know this correlation is not, you know, does not equal causation. Um, you know, we often see an increase in these respiratory infections in the wintertime because people are typically indoors for longer periods of time. They're thus exposed to more people, which means that they're potentially exposed to more viruses. So these are all transmitted by respiratory droplets or airborne transmission. Um, and then of course, you know, hygiene practices can obviously affect that. We've actually seen this year 
that um, respiratory infection prevalence has been lower than expected aside from COVID-19 um, because we've been doing all of these mitigation measures. So we've almost completely abolished the flu season. We've see, we're seeing lower incidence of, of colds and other things like that. Andrea, I just, I'm so sorry. I just had a, <laughs> a very random thought from about, oh, well, over a decade ago when we were in college, we would all go outside. Do you remember this? Uh, we would line up outside the club in the dead of winter. This is in New York, scantily clad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's putting it nicely. Oh and gosh. what did we do to warm up? We would all huddle together, yeah. right? And then, <laughs> and then go into a club jam-packed with people. So anyway, oh sorry, just, just a random thought. But No, I guess- it's totally. <laughs> totally true. I mean, obviously other things that make you more susceptible, especially in college, you know, be things like sleep deprivation and, and you know, that's a high, you know, hygiene practices. Jess, you remember that time that we were shot girls at that club? Oh my God, Andrea. <laughs> I do. I sure And do. I just think about all of the poor hygiene practices um, and as well as being crammed inside a club. Exactly. So I guess the, the takeaway here, as you said, is that we obviously now we've, we've come to accept germ theory. We understand that you you have to ex- you have to be exposed to a pathogen, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just the cold exposure; um, it's actual. You have to still be exposed to something. So um, I, I was reading up. I'm sure you have um, some some research that you want to cite. A- as you said, some viruses are more likely to spread during cold weather, right? So we've talked about the rhinovirus. That's um, the the main cause of the common cold. As you said, there are other viruses that can lead to the cold. But I was reading that uh, the rhinovirus does replicate better at cooler temperatures. I, I'm, I'm waiting for you to chime in and say, actually, that's not true. But um, <laughs> I'll jump in when you're okay. <laughs> okay. So I was reading one study that found that immune system cells initiate a more robust antiviral defense at lung temperatures versus nasal cavity temperature. And we know that the the body, uh, excuse me, the temperature of our bodies is going to be warmer than what's in our, in our noses, right? In our nasal cavity. So, you know, this might mean that the body may not fight the virus as well if the temperature in the nose and the upper airway is lowered by environmental cold. Some other studies that I was reading assert that the flu virus is most stable in cool, dry temperatures. But then there were other studies that show that the disease is also prevalent in humid, warm climates. And I can attest to this, living in Florida, the flu exists here, right? Um, so, sorry, I'm, you chime in. I'm sure you have something to yeah, say. I mean, you know, so obviously viruses as well as other pathogens have optimal breeding, you know, re- reproductive conditions. Um, you know, things that are a little bit cooler and a little bit less humid um, can promote survival of viruses, generally speaking, a little bit better. But we're only talking about, you know, a couple of degrees here. There have been a variety of studies when they've actually artificially um, introduced virus into, um, you know, the nasal cavities of participants and then exposed them to cold temperatures or didn't expose them. And there was no difference uh, in susceptibility to infection. And so, you know, yes, you know, if someone lives in a slightly cooler environment, a slightly drier environment that might facilitate spread a little bit better, but it's not really making or breaking anything. Um, you know, there's been a few reviews, um, particularly one that, you know, a lot of people cite, uh, you know, cold depresses the immune function, as you kind of just mentioned. And um, several reviews have concluded that there is no, um, you know, physiological support that moderately cold temperatures, such as the ones that we would be exposed to in the winter time, um, you know, will will suppress immune function to the point that it would really lead to changes in prevalence of infection. It's it's really the exposure to the bacteria or the viruses and not the cold weather itself. So that's the takeaway, right? The cold itself does not cause illness. It's the exposure to a pathogen that does that. Um, worth noting that if you do have a condition such as asthma, the cold may exist exacerbate your your condition. But again, you still need exposure to some sort of a pathogen to cause illness. 
Right. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously this is, you know, we see this more in the winter because as we mentioned, um, we have a tendency to be indoors with other people, thus promoting the spread of of these pathogens that circulate all the time. All right, Andrea, we have to move on to this next one. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've got a lot to say about it. And I know you've really dug into the research (laughs) and have something to say. So we, we got so many people. So we heard from the herd that you guys really wanted to hear about this. So should we drink cranberry juice to treat a urinary tract infection, a UTI? So let's just kick things off by saying that about 60% of women, so more than half of women, will experience a UTI at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. They're the absolute worst. Raising Um, my hand over here. Well, (laughs) honestly, and and Andrea, I'm about to share, overshare right now. (laughs) Sorry in advance for, for TMI, but I'm actually being treated right now for UTI. Uh, I am super prone to them. I have been my whole life. You know, we could talk. I mean, we could talk about this for so long, but, you know, uh, we know that uh, they tend to be uh, correlated with sexual activity. There's also um, an association with uh, GI stuff, right? So I just got over a bout of norovirus, which I think probably had something to do with this. Sorry again for for (laughs) TMI folks. Um, So I've heard this all the time. And I'm actually just going to kick things off with a little, this is an anecdote here, but I heard this my whole life. So when I was in college, I had a UTI and what did I do? I ran to the pharmacy rather than going to the doctor and getting myself actually checked and cultured to identify the bacteria and get an antibiotic for it. I went and I got one of those over-the-counter, you know, those cranberry tablets, Mm -hmm. um, which apparently is supposed to be the equivalent of drinking um, a lot of (laughs) of cranberry juice. And and we'll talk about what what the ingredient is and, you know, that the rationale behind using cranberries and cranberry juice. So what I did was I took these tablets and what happened? I didn't actually get myself diagnosed and I did not get proper treatment for this. And I'm sorry if I'm ruining the punchline here, but proper treatment for an infection for a UTI is an antibiotic. So what happened? It got worse and worse and it actually traveled traveled up my kidneys and I got something called pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. And that was horrendous. I ended up in the ER. I needed IV antibiotics. So I just need to preface that if you think you have a UTI, please get yourself to the doctor. But let's... Uh, (laughs) I'm cringing over here. Yes. I've been fortunate to be able to kind of head mine off early on when you start to get those... uh, the pain and the the frequency symptoms, and I'm mm-hmm. paranoid, so I always run to the doctor and and you know get that taken care of as quickly as possible. So, Andrew, do you want to t- tell us a little bit about the history of this? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the the logic behind cranberry juice or cranberries for UTIs, it's a century old centuries-old remedy. Uh, Many Native American tribes utilized cranberries for a variety of ailments, and they passed this practice on to the pilgrims. And, you know, obviously their their scientific method, it was limited back then. So, So let's talk a little bit about UTI. So UTIs are caused by bacterial infections, Um, typically uh, E. coli or Escherichia coli, which is normally found in the GI tract. Now, it can also be caused by other bacteria and things like that. Um, Ultimately, what's happening is bacteria are introduced into the urethra, um, also the bladder, and eventually can spread to the kidneys, um, as just mentioned, um, if they're left untreated. So UTIs are more common in women than in men, um, and some of this is due to the proximity of the urinary tract to the anus in women compared to men. Um, There is some indication that these can be exacerbated or caused by sexual activity and other STIs. Um, But ultimately what happens is bacteria get introduced into the urinary tract where they don't belong and they colonize. And what they do is they form something called a biofilm, which is like a network, uh, a layer of bacteria that is very, very um, resistant to being cleared. So Um, And the reason I mention this is because there's actually a little bit of science behind the rationale um, of regard to using cranberry juice. And this is the presence of a compound called proanthocyanidins in cranberry. And this compound, PAC, 
has been thought to inhibit the ability of these bacteria to attach to the cells in that urinary tract. So if they can't grab onto it and they can't form this biofilm, then they can't colonize it. Um, So there's been some in vitro studies where they looked at the actual PAC compound in, in basically Petri dishes and said, oh, well, it, it can actually reduce the ability of E. coli to attach and things like that. But of course, we know that in vitro is not the same as in a person. Um, so there's been a variety of studies that have come out um, looking to kind of address this. And in 2016, Ocean Spray, um, obviously, there's a little bit of conflict of interest there, but they published a self-funded study in the Journal of Clinical Nutrition that claimed that drinking eight ounces of cranberry juice daily reduced the risk of UTI by 40%. Now, this study had quite a few flaws, and, and one of them was the fact that the cranberry juice they were using wasn't even pure cranberry juice. It was cranberry juice cocktail. um, And that's only about 30% actual fruit juice. Um, So there was a lot of flaws in there. And of course, um, you know, we want to take a self-funded study with a grain of salt. So so a different study, uh, so in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, they published a study in 2016. And what they did was they looked at female nursing home patients who took a standardized high-dose cranberry capsule, which was the equivalent of 20 ounces of, of pure cranberry juice daily for a year, and compared it to those female nursing home patients who did not. And they found that there was no difference in the incidence or prevalence of UTIs. Um, Now, obviously, there have been a a few other studies. Um, Jess, I'm going to hand it over to you to summarize a couple of those. Sure, sure. So there was a meta-analysis performed that actually analyzed 24 studies. So in total across the studies, there were just under 4,500 participants to assess whether there's evidence to recommending cranberry juice for UTIs. And they concluded that there was no evidence um, to suggest that UTIs can be cured or prevented by cranberry supplementation. And this was true for the occurrence of UTI, as well as the recurrence of repeated UTIs. And uh, this was also found across different demographic groups as well. So then the European Food Safety Organization concluded, um, you know, they came to a similar conclusion uh, on the basis of data presented. The panel concluded that the claimed effect is prevention of adhesion of E. coli to uroepithelial cells, which is a risk factor for developing UTIs. However, a cause and effect relationship has not been established between the consumption of Cran Max, which I'm assuming is cranberry juice that's common in in, in Europe. Um, I think and, it's a I think it's like a cranberry pill, cranberry oh supplement. cranberry pill. Oh, like yeah. AZO here. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. Um, and reduction of the risk of UTI by inhibiting the adhesion of certain bacteria in the urinary tract. So, yeah. So just that's mm-hmm. basically saying that you know that that PAC compound that you know they thought in cranberries might reduce the the ability of these bacteria to form these biofilms. Um, you know, at least in this study that was reviewed by the European Food Safety Organization, there was no evidence evidence that those supplements actually had any sort of beneficial effect on reducing UTIs. Well, and a big issue that you touched on, I would think, is that there's got to be so much variation across, you know, we're talking about different supplements, different juices, and, you know, it all, I'm sure that the the concentration of that compound that you mentioned earlier, you know, PAC, uh, you know, that, that might also uh, impact outcomes. But, you know, that's a great point. And I think I remember, I can't remember the actual dosage, but they were saying that in order to actually exert a physiological effect it was it was more more than you could possibly consume even if you were essentially mass maxing out on cranberry juice um, daily so um, I think that's a good point you know it's not the dose makes the poison but it's dosage matters right to right so even if this molecule that's present in cranberries may have some effect it might not be physically possible to actually consume the amount of it that you would need to actually exert that effect. So bottom line, Andrea, is that um, clinical studies on the efficacy of cranberry juice and extracts for preventing UTIs are conflicting at best, right? You know, to your point, if we really can't even consume the amount of that compound needed to, to, to truly uh, 
prevent or treat UTIs. If you suspect at all <laughs> that you have a UTI, you need to go to your OBGYN or to your to your physician or to your medical provider <laughs> and get yourself diagnosed and get proper treatment. Right. Anything else and to I say? Think, I, yeah. I think one other thing um, that's important, you know, we talk about E. coli is the most common cause of UTIs, but it can be caused by other bacteria. And, you know, there are different classes of antibiotics. And of course, you want to make sure that you take the best medicine for your infection. So going to the doctor and getting cultured and really identifying what you're infected with is also going to improve your treatment as well. Exactly. Okay. Let's, maybe we can... Um, round things out here with this with this next old wives tale that I've always found kind of disgusting. Um, a lot of people wrote in with this and it's that raw, you, you should put raw cut onions in your socks overnight to cure cold. Have you heard this one, Andrea? I have. And I also need to say that this is um, very popular among the, I don't want to say anti-science or the fringe science crowd. And they talk about how, you know, this sucks all the toxins out of your body and things like that. Um, I love that phrase. Right. Yes. Right, yes. Right. So, you know, the story goes that if you have a cold or the flu, you should slice an onion into rounds and place them on the bottoms of your feet, put on a pair of socks and leave them on overnight as you sleep. And then in the morning, you're going to wake up feeling great, cured of your illness. I, this just seems like a stinky, slimy mess. <laughs> and as we're going to talk about, there's no science behind this. Sorry to ruin the punchline there. But let's talk about the, the origin of this remedy. So this particular tale uh, originates back as early as the 1500s. I did not know it, but apparently there is a National Onion Association. By the way, I love onions, so I am I am pro onion. <laughs> um, and so it was widely believed that placing again placing raw cut up onion around your home. They were, this is what the, sorry this is what the National Onion Association said that back you know as early as the 1500s it was widely believed that placing raw cut up onion around your home could protect you from the bubonic plague. Now I really want to do an episode, Andrea, on oh, sort of the, the yes. history of epidemiology. Um, so back in the day during those times, people thought that infections were spread by something called miasma, which mm -hmm. was literally just like stinky air, right? Poisonous, right. noxious air. <laughs> People thought originally before we knew that the bubonic plague was caused by, you know, Yersinia pestis, which is a bacteria transmitted by infected fleas, they thought it was spread by basically the the sewage air that was seeping up, you know, from the ground all over, you know, urban, urban Europe. And yes, I agree. It's a fascinating topic. Um, we also be yeah. talking about the humors on a future episode oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, back then that was, that was their, the limitation, right? That they didn't right. have the scientific method. Um, well, and interestingly, I always, I think it's really cool that the, obviously they got the cause wrong, right? Miasma, mm -hmm. it's not this noxious air, but a lot of the things that they did to combat this stinky air, you know, some of these public health laws and sanitation laws and things, they did help reduce disease, right? But they, right. they had the cause all wrong. So, right. <laughs> right. right? Um, so this idea of putting onions in your socks may also stem from the ancient Chinese medicinal practice of foot reflexology. And so the nerves and the feet have been a focal point of Eastern medicine for thousands of years and are thought um, to act as access points to the internal organs. So, you know, yeah, Andrea, some, uh, yeah. they mm -hmm. talk about like the different meridians on the bottom of the feet and things right. like that and how that controls, you know, physiology around the body. Right. So onions, we know, are rich in sulfuric compounds, right? That's why they smell. Um, and so according to the folklore, when people place them on the feet, these compounds infiltrate the body and they then kill bacteria and viruses and purify the blood. As you said, Andrea, this is very common among the pseudoscientific crowd, this idea of detoxifying the blood, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and also, again, these claims of placing onions around the room will rid the air of viruses, toxins, and chemicals. The 
there is absolutely no scientific evidence to support this claim at all. So while while onions are slightly acidic and they may have some antibacterial properties, obviously they're nothing compared to rubbing alcohol or bleach. And this is only for external application, right? So we know that viruses require direct contact with a human host to spread, and an onion is not able to draw in a virus and absorb it. So what about the ingestion of onions, Andrea? What do you think about that? So, you know, I mean, obviously we're talking about putting onion slices on someone's feet. Um, So, you know, just as eating some onions is not going to do anything to some sort of external bacterial infection, say you have a staph infection on your skin or something like that. Um, A topical application of onions, like putting them on your feet, um, are obviously not going to help cure anything that's going on internally, meaning some sort of internal infection. And that's really the claim that we're debunking at this point. But I also think it's worth mentioning that Eating onions, you know, especially at the amount that humans would consume them, is not curing internal infections either. Um, you know, just because onions contain some compounds that have some evidence that they may be antibacterial or antiviral, again, we need to be clear about the effective dose. Um, you know, they're not they're not going to be used to cure or treat anything, whether it's by eating them or by rubbing them on your feet or putting them in your room. Right. And then also just to touch on this practice of foot reflexology, many studies have been done to assess their uh, effectiveness. And a review of foot reflexology studies showed little evidence, little to no evidence, that reflexology is uh, is an effective practice for treating just about any medical condition. Um, There's actually some research that shows that foot reflexology can actually make infections worse. Uh, But worth noting that the overall quality of the the research on reflexology is generally very low and should be taken with a grain of salt. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I was just going to I was going to echo echo that sentiment. Um, You know, I think regardless of where this I don't know, I don't even know what to call this story came from, whether it be. you know, um, historical from the bubonic plague or whether it's from Chinese reflexology, there's, there's no evidence that, you know, putting onions on your feet is going to do anything other than make your feet, your socks and your bed very smelly. Oh my God, that just sounds horrific. Um, (laughs) Okay, so we had so many other um, old wives tales that we want to get through, but I think we should save those for next week. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Want to take us home, Andrea? All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We hoped you learned a thing or two, and uh, we appreciate your patience in the current chaos that Jess and I are both in the midst of. But um, if you like our pod, please share with your friends and family. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Be sure to check out our website at www.unbiasedscipod.com. You can see all the links to the studies we discuss on every episode. Um, you can also listen to our episodes directly there if you're not into the apps. Um, you can also pick yourself up some Unbiased Science merch or leave us a donation. Um, next week, we're just going to do uh, part two of the health-related old wives' tales and what the science actually says. In the meantime, we will continue continue to provide updates on COVID-19 vaccine progress, as well as the ongoing pandemic on our social media accounts. So be sure to follow those on Instagram and Facebook at Unbiased SciPod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science. Yeah, oh, I am a sci-